Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this afternoon. Uh, my name is David Aiden Rivera. I'm a UT Health Pain Management Specialist. Um, I'm fellowship trained in uh, pain management, as well as my primary specialty being anesthesiology. Um, we're here to talk to you about pain awareness this month and just kind of understanding the things that we can offer, how we can treat pain, and how we can best uh, take care of you as a patient in, in our facilities. Um, if you have any questions uh, while we're talking, please comment and we'll take a look at them and we'll be able to answer those um, for you as well. So the first question um, I get is what's the goal, uh, what's my goal as a pain management specialist? Well my goal is to try to minimize your pain as best I can. Um, there are different modalities um, and one of the, there's basically two different pathways. One is obviously medication management which uh, everybody talks about narcotics but there are also anti-inflammatory pain medicines, neuropathic or nerve pain medicines, um, and also muscle relaxants. Different things that we can do to treat pain, not just narcotic pain medicines. And then the other side of the coin is we also do interventions, which is where we do uh, steroid injections into the back, into different joints in the back, but not just in the back, we can also do it into joints into the knee, the shoulder, into the hip. And so depending on what your pain is, we can uh, try to attack it best we can by doing an intervention, which will hopefully address the pain more specifically. Another question we get is, what are common conditions uh, that often cause patients pain? And then do you have certain areas of specialty, such as back, headaches, or joints? So um, most of the conditions that we typically deal with are neck, back, and spine. Um, I do deal with arthritic joints as well, depending on if the orthopedic uh, colleagues of mine decide to refer you to me for different treatment modalities that maybe you don't want surgery, and you're looking for a different option, or you're unable to have surgery, then we can do uh, some knee injections or even some uh, uh, procedures that we call ablations, where we uh, actually destroy the certain nerves to the knees um, and also other parts of the body, which sounds scary, but I often tell patients, if if you're, someone told you you had to have your appendix removed, you wouldn't go, don't take my appendix. These nerves are actually not needed for you to move or for you to feel anything else except for a specific area, so therefore we can go and ablate those nerves to help deal with pain. And my practice has really grown, um, and our practice really has grown, with the admin of that, and we're pushing forward with a lot more for more direct treatment of that. As far as specific areas, I mentioned back and, and uh, uh, spine is our main area of specialty, but we also do headaches. There are some procedures that I do for headache pain, um, and we can definitely address those in an office visit. Um, how do you approach diagnosing the cause of a person's pain? One of the biggest misconceptions that I think that I get is, well, let's get an MRI or an x-ray, or I was told I had a bulging disc by uh, X person, and so I need to come see you. And, you know, what I always say is that that's probably 30% imaging is about 30% of what we do. It's an important part of what we do, but the main thing, 70% of what we do is actually history and physical exam. You know, um, at the end of it all, what I always tell patients is if the x-ray or the MRI or a CT scan was to give me all the information that I needed about you, I could just sit in this office and make phone calls and talk to you all day, but instead I need to lay hands on you, I need to examine you, and make sure that perhaps whatever is being shown on the scan is symptomatic for you. So one of the things that we don't want to do is just automatically treat a disc bulge, and then I go and examine you and I find out it's a joint in the buttock that's really causing the pain, and that's something that's more of a, a clinical diagnosis, me a history and physical, me talking to you and laying hands, as opposed to me getting an x-ray or an MRI. So to make sure that we do the right and hopefully try to give you the best option for a good outcome, it's really important to come in for a visit. And, and imaging plays a role, um, but it, it allows me to have a picture of your spine or of, of an affected area and gives me insight to what I can see what's going on. But again, I try to put it together with your history and physical. Um, <clears throat> how do you determine the best treatment options for the patients? I've kind of already alluded to that a second ago. Um, I think it's important, again, that once we're done talking, I always also have a model, uh, usually in every room, that way we can kind of show you the model and kind of explain what's going on. Because my goal is that when you leave, you're at least be able to have an understanding of what we're doing, why we're treating. Um, I never want you to leave here and say, I don't know what the doctor said. Or a family member says, well, what are they gonna do for you? What's the problem? Why do they think that? And if you say, I don't know, then I didn't do my job in educating you and giving you that knowledge to be able to talk to your family members. When will a patient know it's time to visit a specialist? What I typically say, and this is even to my 
to my primary care colleagues or anyone that wants to refer or thinks about pain management, the minute you think that you are thinking about a pain medicine, a narcotic pain medicine specifically, that should automatically trigger and get, get you to come see a specialist. Because before somebody starts putting you on pain medicines, it's important to see, well, maybe that may not be the best option for you. Maybe you need a nerve pain medicine, or maybe you, because you have an arthritic joint, maybe you need an anti-inflammatory pain medicine. These are non-narcotic options. You know, the, the advent of the opiate epidemic right now, we, we're trying to kind of minimize and really be selective and careful with how we prescribe pain medicines. And so it's really important that we uh, try to minimize that for yourself as well um, so we can avoid addiction and tolerance. And we can always discuss those options in a clinic visit if you need to. But again, I think once that happens, the other thing is after about three to six weeks, a condition can be considered chronic. And so you've gone from what's called the acute phase or subacute phase, meaning a twisted ankle that kind of hurts for three days and then gets better. You've now gone to where, man, my ankle's been hurting for six months or three months. Well, now you've entered into what's called chronic phase, and that's more of what we do as chronic pain specialists. And so then it's also a time to think, well, maybe this will last a little bit longer than three to six weeks. Maybe I should come in and see a specialist or talk to my primary care doctor and see if I need a treatment or a, 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 um, a radiologic uh, examination to find out, is there something going on? Do I have a sprained ligament? Do I need an MRI of my ankle? Do I need x-rays? Is there a fracture? And then if there's not, well, then maybe I do need to see a pain specialist before we just go and jump into pain medicines. How would someone book an appointment with you? For all of our colleagues in our practice, uh, we do like to have primary care referrals. There's a lot of information. Uh, we don't typically take direct referrals. One, because we are considered specialists, some insurances don't automatically allow you to see a specialist without your primary care referring to you. What I would hate to happen is you, we accept you as a patient over the phone, you show up, and then we're like, uh-oh, we have to have an insurance verification referral, and then now we're kind of stuck because your primary care may be busy in their own practice and clinic taking care of patients, and they can't get to you right away, or it takes time to get that referral approved by your insurance. So it's always best to have a primary care referral, plus any kind of imaging you've had done, have them send that over. And the other big thing is, a lot of times there's history and information in your clinical exam in the note from your primary care doctor that'll let us know, oh, you've tried this, you've tried that. And all that history is in there, it's a little bit easier for us to read and review it, and then we actually kind of have somewhat of a game plan of what we're gonna offer you, or what we may wanna ask you about when you come in to visit with us. Um, at, that, at this point, I'd like to I'll open up to any questions if anybody's viewing. Um, if, if not, well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you. Again, uh, we're practicing at the University of Texas, East Texas um, campus. Uh, we're in the Olympic Plaza. And any, any information, you can find us on the website. Um, and also, again, uh, we really highly recommend uh, referrals. Um, if you have your primary care send a referral over, it helps with insurance verification. So, you know, again, we don't want to have any issues the day of the visit. We want to make sure it's a nice, smooth, and, and uh, uh, less painful process, so to speak. All right.